Charles is pointing to me, and it's time to start our program tonight, uh, Bible study. Before we do that, as we have been doing the last few weeks, we're going to look at the um, prayer list first. And, um, of course, we always want to remember the pastor search team and uh, Tom, Willie's neighbor. I uh, saw Robert Williams uh, a few minutes ago, and uh, he's, uh, his strength in his hands is strong, but he's is still working on his legs. But he's getting better. He's getting there. He's doing a little bit more walking. He's in a wheelchair, and he pushes himself along with his legs, which helps strengthen that. So he is doing better, and hopefully one day I'll go over there, and he won't be there. But he'll be home having walked out of that place. Uh, Anna Louise O'Brien, she's Bridget Lawson's mom, and she's at River Oaks Nursing Home. Uh, Alan Russell is at home, uh, recovering, and Bill and Dartha Wilkerson. Bill has Alzheimer's, and Dartha is his caregiver, and she's having a rough time, from what I understand. J.C. Holmes, Phil Holmes' father, has inoperable um, uh, heart condition. Cleta Bandy. Pray for the salvation of her granddaughter. Uh, Margaret Arnold is, um, who is, who is that, Charles? Huh? Is that Tony's mom? Yes. Okay, would, is she having surgery or? She's just, you know, not, just health problems. Just health problems, okay. Not doing well, so we won't remember her. Uh, Jeff and Carol Teradanova. Um, Belinda Perkey. And today is Belinda's birthday. Uh, I'm not going to say how old she is, but Ann told me. But anyway, today is her birthday. Happy birthday, Belinda. And I also want to pray for her dad, Ken, and um, pray for Ruby Langford, uh, Johnny Walker's cousin. She's at Park West. Uh, Pastor Aaron and Lynette Jim in Tehachi Baptist Church in New Mexico. And then for the college students and parents as they're starting a new year, plus all the elementary and high school students as they've gone back to school and continue to do so. And, and we did not get him on there, but David Ray had a procedure and he's on recovery and doing fine. Did fine. Okay, David Ray. All right. Um, anybody else on the list that we've missed? Okay. Um, Children's Bible Drill will be August 31st, which is next Wednesday, and it'll be in, th in the sanctuary. Plus, they're going to have a uh, summer missions share service uh, and shared this past Sunday. And, and then the rest of them, um, uh, Blake Mathis and the group from Honduras and the group that went to New Mexico will be sharing about their experiences uh, following the Children's Bible Drill. And then the box, next boxes of blessing will be Sunday, September the 4th. Um, and then the all-day work day will be September the 10th. And if you hadn't signed up, there are sheets in various places in the building. Just sign up. Uh, starts at 8 o'clock, and lunch will be provided. The basically it says church leadership meeting with the church council is September the 18th at 6 o'clock uh, here in the youth house, and that's a Sunday. And then the business meeting will follow on the following Wednesday, September 21st, 6.30 in the sanctuary. So we will not have Bible study that night, but have business meeting in the sanctuary. Okay, does anybody have any other prayer requests? Or We've got a couple, Ms. Ms. Pam said thank you for praying for her. Yep. And uh, Ms. Naomi has one, uh, Darren Fox in Ohio. Should be praying for him. Okay. Right. Yeah, Pam is doing it. You want to report on her, Anthony? Yeah, she, uh, um, tomorrow she'll get her drainage tube out and um, she'll get her staples out from her surgery. Good, good. Well, I'm glad they, glad they caught it. Yeah, her, her, well, her, her appendix did burst and uh, so it, it had put infection in her body and then she ended up driving herself to the hospital not realizing that's what happened. <laughs> yeah. So... Well, I'm glad, glad she's doing well. Thank you for all the prayers, and she's doing pretty good. Okay. What hospital is she in? Uh, she's out of the hospital. She goes back tomorrow. It's in Farmville. Farmville. Yeah. Okay. Farmville, Virginia. Yeah. Know where it is. 
Okay, anything else? Mr. Rick, how's it going? Good. Good. Anthony, would you lead us in a prayer tonight? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this evening that we come in your house and have Bible study and have prayer time and hear praises where you've answered our prayers and bring our requests to you, Heavenly Father, for where, where we need things and praying for so many people that need healing, Lord God. We pray for these students going back to the universities and the colleges and the high schools and elementary schools. I pray you'd anoint them and bless them and that they'd be your, your messengers and be good Christians and help disciple folks wherever they go. I would thank you for the mission outreaches that have taken place here at this church. and We just uh, can't wait to hear all the good news and good reports to come. We pray for all the ministries that are taking place in this church. We pray for all the church families. We pray for abundance, Heavenly Father, when it comes to uh, giving and opening our hands. And we pray that folks would use their spiritual gifts to come here and serve you. And we just thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, sir. Okay, we are um, continuing in Psalm 119. And tonight's lesson, it's a good one. Um, today when I told um, Ann that they did a biopsy on my head and I uh, know in about two weeks, you know, she, um, she had a prayer for me, which, for which I was grateful. And, um, and she asked me what the theme was tonight and I'd forgotten what it was, but anyway, I've, I texted her later and said, said, the theme of tonight's lesson is God is all we need. And it don't make any difference what we're going through, what circumstances we're facing in our life. We can realize that God is all that we need when we're facing the turmoils that we're facing in our nation right now. Just as, as a Christian, you know, people are wringing their hands and saying, oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? You know, we need to elect this person, that person, so we can get things changed. But as a Christian, our whole focus needs to be of saying God is all we need. In everything that we do. Now the problem is that Israel had a serious problem with that concept because every time they faced difficulties within the nation of Israel instead of turning to God they turned away from him and um, for example as the sermon I preached a few weeks ago and also the Sunday school lesson um, that we've been looking at in 2 Kings when it was talking about uh, the prophet Elijah when he faced the 400 prophets of Baal. And the reason he faced the 400 prophets of Baal is because Jezebel, Ahab's wife, had brought in all of these, these false prophets to come in. And the people, and they, they had turned the people away from worshiping God to worshiping the false god of Baal. And um, you remember Elijah, when all of this was said and done, and he... He was running from Jezebel because she had put out a contract on his life. And um, he went off and got by a stream and went into a cave. And, and God asked him the question saying, you know, what, what, where are you, Elijah? And he said, I'm here. I'm the only one who serves you. And God says, what do you mean? I got 7,000 prophets stuck out here who are, who are serving me. What makes you think you're the only one out here? And so um, at the top of Mount uh, Carmel, uh, of course, God won that battle as he wins every battle that, that he's confronted with or people confront him with. And, um, and then the drought ended and uh, the people saw that, that God, Jehovah God, was the one that they should be worshiping and that he was truly all that they needed. And then when Israel was faced with uh, enemies coming against them, you know, wanting to overrun them. Instead of turning to God, the first thing they did is that they turned to other nations. Um, nations like Egypt and things to come and bail them out and protect them from their enemy. Um, through these action, these and other actions, the children of Israel proved over and over again that they really truly did not believe in Jehovah was the source, was truly the source of all that they needed. Um, and I think many times, even today, uh, we find ourselves, when faced with difficulties, that one of the first things that we do is that we 
oh, woe is me, woe is me. Instead of getting on our face before God and putting our hands together and praying and seeking His face and saying, God, you are in control and you're not oblivious to what's going on. You know what's happening. In fact, in many ways, we might think that God has orchestrated much of the stuff that's going on in our world today. Um, as, we, um, as we look at this segment, uh, verses 57 through 64, we see the psalmist is helping us to see that God is truly all that we need. And, and the question that we need to ask ourselves in this section is that knowing that, do we really know that? Do, are we really listening to what God is saying to us and will we allow him to do his mighty work in and through us or will we continue to seek solutions elsewhere such as through politics or political and military alliances? In this segment, the psalmist offers three answers to this dilemma. The first is in verses 57 through 58, he says, God is our portion. For it says in verses 57 and 58, You are my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep your words. I entreated your favor with my whole heart. Be merciful to me according to your word. So the psalmist opens this segment by saying to the Lord that he was his portion. Now basically, the word portion means it's a real estate language and refers to the apportioning of the promised land to the children of Israel. Now Jeremiah used this language of the portion of Jacob in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 16, when he said, The portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the maker of all things. So in other words, the portion of Jacob it's referring to God, referring to Jehovah, uh, Elohim. Um, and he said, He is the maker of all things, and Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. David said the same thing in Psalm 16, 5 and 6. And I'm sorry, I forgot to do the scriptures and let you all read some of this, so I'll just read it tonight. But anyway, Psalm 16, 5 and 6. O oh Lord, you are, you are the portion, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup, and you maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. Now the word lines in verse 6 refers to the property lines which are drawn for one's inheritance. Believers today have a rich spiritual inheritance in the Lord Jesus Christ. So in other words, if, say, um, I inherit some land from the family, well, the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to get a surveyor to go out there and survey that land to make sure I know point A, point B, D, and C as to where that land is going to be and what part belongs to me. So that's what he's saying here is that you have laid out the lines, you have given me the inheritance that you promised to me. Um, believers today have a rich spiritual inheritance in the Lord Jesus Christ. The psalmist laid out this portion because he had kept the word of the Lord even in the midst of adverse circumstances. That is why I believe that Daniel was the one who wrote Psalm 119. Because during his time in Babylon, he went through a lot of trials and a lot of struggles. And it was the Word of God that was his mainstay. That's, that's the main thing that kept Daniel going through all this time. Daniel prayed every day. He entreated the Lord's favor upon him and his friends based upon the promises found in the Word of God. The second thing that we see in this passage in this, uh, these verses, these eight-verse eight, eight verse segment, is found in verses 59 through 60, indicating that God is our master. Okay, 59 and 60. I thought about my ways and turned my feet to your testimonies. I made haste and did not delay to keep your commandments. In the ancient times, um, when a person was in servitude to another person, 
that servant would never dare not to obey the master's commands. Whatever the master said to him to do, he did. You remember in the, in the Gospels when Jesus talked about um, when the servant came in from the fields having worked all day, that you know, you would think that somebody coming in after working all day that they would be able to sit down and have a meal. But no, that wasn't the case. When they came in, the master was sitting at the table and expected the servant to go in and serve him before the servant could ever take care of his own needs. And if a servant did not fulfill the responsibilities that uh, the master placed upon him, then the servant could be punished, uh, imprisoned, or even put to death. Uh, as we look at Nehemiah, that was the first sermon series I preached when I came here. And Nehemiah, you know, when he went before the king to ask permission to go to Jerusalem, um, it, was a, it was a dangerous time because the king could have said no, could have taken Nehemiah out, could have put him in prison, could have even killed him at that particular moment. But he didn't do that. And also Joseph is another classic example of this uh, principle that a servant must do what the master tells them to do. And thus the psalmist, in talking to the Lord, indicated that he had thought about his ways and made certain that he was turning his way to do the Lord's command. So literally, he turned his feet the way he was walking toward doing the Lord's testimonies. So in other words, he was, he was at one point walking this way, and then basically he turned his feet and he kept turning his feet until he was headed in the direction of God's testimonies. And so that's, that's what that, that meant in verse, um, uh, verse 59. It says, I thought about my ways. In other words, his ways were not totally according to God's, God's ways. And he says, I turned my feet. In other words, I did that 180 and I turned back to following your testimonies uh, and doing the things that you had commanded me to do. As a servant of the Lord, we should have the same commitment to obedience to obey His commands, which are not grievous, but are designed for our good and for the furtherance of the kingdom. Several weeks back when I did the uh, healthy traits for the church, when I did the last three, one of them dealt with discipline. Uh, for a servant to please his master, he must be obedient and quick about his duties or else he will be disciplined severely. If we fail in our duties, Jesus will also discipline us, not with punitive action, although that might happen from time to time, but in a manner that will get our attention and get us back on track with him and get us to turn our feet to walk back towards his testimonies. When we come to Jesus in repentance and faith, we literally made a covenant with him that we would follow him faithfully and learn of him and his desire for our life. The third thing that we see in this uh, segment uh, that we're looking at tonight in verses 61 through 64, and that is God is our greatest joy. So we've talked about God is our portion, God is our master, and now God is our greatest joy. Verse 61 through 64. And the cords of the wicked have bound me, but I have not forgotten your law. At midnight I rise and give thanks to you because of your righteous judgments. I am a companion of all who fear you and those who keep your precepts. The earth, O Lord, is full of your mercy. Teach me your statutes. The psalmist brings this segment to a conclusion by saying that the wicked had encircled him and bound him. And that's why, again, it goes back to where I think it, it Daniel was the one who wrote this, because Daniel suffered a lot. David suffered a lot, but Daniel um, was not in the same position that David was in. David was a king, and he had people that came against him, but Daniel was not the, the king, and so consequently he constantly had enemies uh, who came against him uh, to turn him away from serving the, the Lord. Uh, but he continues by saying that he had not forgotten the word of God, for it was that that sustained him in his darkest moments of persecution. Prisoners of war, uh, those who are persecuted because of their Christian faith, etc., testify constantly of the fact that, that, that God 
had sustained them, that the word of God had sustained them, because they, they faithfully kept the word through their time of incarceration or, or persecution that they might have been facing. Now in verse 62, the psalmist points to his faithfulness to arise at midnight and give thanks to the Lord for his righteous judgments. Whenever we are faced with difficult days in our life, the one thing that we should never ever forget, and that is God is righteous in all his judgments. Now, for him to rise at midnight required a lot of commitment on his part. Sometimes I, I rise at midnight, but not because I'm praying, because I just can't sleep, you know. And, uh, but uh, in this case, whoever wrote Psalm 119 indicated that he had a habit of arising at midnight and going before the Lord and praying and seeking his wisdom. Huh? Yeah, he had to do it in secret, yeah. But he really didn't because his enemies constantly saw him standing at the window praying, you know, toward Jerusalem. Um, in verse 63, the psalmist says uh, that those I associate with are those who also fear or reverence God. If people want a good reason for attending church, verse 63 is it. For it reads, um, I am, am a companion of all who fear you and of those who keep your precepts. So in other words, he is saying that I associate with those who are faithful to you. Uh, many people say, I do not go to church because they're hypocrites in church or the people in church are not perfect. Well, guess what? You're not perfect either, you know. And so the church is a place where all of us who know the Lord or seeking the Lord will come to receive strength one from another. And that is why it's important that we spend time in the presence of the Lord in his sanctuary. Uh, Second Corinthians tells us that we are to be faithful to be, uh, attend church and to uh, associate with people of faith. In verse 64, the psalmist acknowledges that the earth is full of God's mercy. And it may not appear that way at times, but never forget that God is still God and he's still on his throne. And he still is in charge. He does not change. It should be our daily joy to learn of him and his judgments and statutes and precepts and thus growing in his grace and knowledge each and every day. And so the bottom line of this segment is this. As I said at the beginning, God is all we need. That's it. You know, we don't need anything else in our life. God is all we need. The Satan-controlled world tries to convince us that it has all the answers through politics, entertainment, and other things. But the answer has always been, and always will be, God and God alone. When we came to Jesus, there should have been joy that filled our heart. And that joy should have never disappeared, but that which sustains us for the living of every day, and in sharing that which makes us joyful, and that is Jesus Christ. And so, as, as we look at this, we see that the psalmist is saying to us, God is our portion, God is our master, and God is the one who brings us the greatest joy of all. And so, again, reading, reading that passage from 57 to 64, you are my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep your words. I entreated your favor with my whole heart. Be merciful to me according to your word. I thought about my ways and turned my feet to your testimonies. I made haste and did not delay to keep your commandments. The cords of the wicked have bound me, but I have not forgotten your law. At midnight, I rise and give thanks to you because of your righteous judgments. I am a companion of all who fear you and of those who keep your precepts. The earth, O Lord, is full of your mercy. Teach me your statutes. So every day that needs to be our prayer. Lord, teach us your statutes. Teach us your ways. Teach us, Lord. Every day that we awaken and turn the TV on and discover all the problems that exist today, and we, we sometimes we go, woe is me. We just need to stop and say, Lord, you are my portion. You're my master. You're the one that brings me joy. You're the one who is in control. 
and I give my heart completely to you on this day to do what you desire to do in me as I go about the task. Father, thank you for opportunities that we have to study your word. Thank you for this segment of Psalm 119. Lord, it's a powerful segment to remind us in this troublesome day in which we live in our nation and our world that, Lord, you are all we need. And uh, help us, O oh God, as your followers to trust you and to lean upon you in all circumstances of our life and not to sway to the left or to the right, Lord, but keep focused on you to keep our feet focused and moving in the right direction, and that is toward you and toward your precepts and toward your word, that it might become a total part of our lives. Help us, O oh God, to read the word, to study the word, to memorize the word, to apply the word, that others might have the opportunity to know you as we do. And we give you the praise and glory and thank you, Lord, for each opportunity that we have to come together. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, thank you, those online and those here. Appreciate you coming.